All right, welcome everyone to another episode of Peter and Code. My name is Peter and apologies first of all about the long delay between this video and the last one. I was incredibly busy with different projects and also just busy with learning new things that I could teach you on this channel. So this episode is going to be about software architecture in gen general again. And what I've been reading in the last couple of weeks has been an incredibly interesting book, which is called Fundamentals of Software Architecture. Right, there you go, by Mark Richards and Neil Ford. And I can highly, highly recommend it. It's an incredibly interesting book about um, how to become a software architect or more, what does a, a software architect do? And I wanted to take one of their main parts of the book and explain it today. So let's imagine that you have the unique um, opportunity to architect and design a, an entire system from scratch. And it's, it's a giant, giant problem now because the question is, how do you get started? And in the book, Fundamentals of Software Architecture, the authors talk about a component identification flow. So it's basically a, a method to analyze the, the problem, analyze the requirements, and then uh, structure the system in very general uh, components. But it's, it's more about um, divide and conquer. So it's more dividing the general, the big problem, the big system into smaller components. And a component here is not something you might know from a live component from Phoenix Live View or uh, from a module, like it's not a component with multiple modules. It's something more generic, more general and bigger. So it's not, it, it can be a single class if it needs to be, but it can also be a cluster of microservices. So it's, it's not um, very specific. So it can be anything you need it to. And the component identification flow has four or five steps, basically. Yeah. So the first step is you identify the initial components. And this can be anything like you can just go in and think, well, I think this system should have these three components, you know, and it can be it can be like, OK, it, it just needs a UI, some business logic and a database. These can be three components if you want to, but it could also be it needs a billing system. It needs um, like any data analysis system, and then it needs a complete self-service for the customer. So it can be very big things as well. And then once you have identified the components, whether they're big or small, you start to assign requirements and user stories to these components. So user stories particularly here are interesting because um, they explain what the system should be able to do or what specific actors should be able to do with the system. And then you also start to analyze whether it makes sense that the user story is mapped to a certain component, or maybe the component needs to be broken into two components. So that's the, the second step then. You assign the requirements and user stories to the components and analyze a bit whether it makes sense. And that also is a bit of the third um, step that you have to do. You analyze the roles themselves. So uh, now I said you have a user and administrator. Well, maybe you have different types of users and, and also you have different types of administrators. So then you might be you might need to break these into two as well. So maybe you have like super, uh, super admins who can do everything. And then you have like regular admins that are able to see every day's uh, data and so on. So then you also have to break down these roles and also analyze whether it makes sense still that these different worlds then still have access to a single component. So maybe super uh, admins have access to a very specific system that nobody else has access to. And the normal administrators have access to the general data science or whatever auditing system. So then you already see again, oh, it doesn't quite make sense um, how I separate or how I, separ uh, how I define the initial components. So I need to restructure them. And that's more like a, um, a user story or a role uh, analysis of the components. And then one interesting um, analysis here is also the architecture characteristic analysis. And architecture characteristics, I will explain them a bit more in depth later, but they define general characteristics of your system or of your components in this case, that they should um, adhere to, that they should be able to, um, to support. So one characteristic could be scalability, which is a very general term, and you need to define this. 
but maybe you see well there is a system in the heart of my uh, sorry there's a component in the heart of my system and that one needs to scale really really well because there are many other systems depending on that particular component so then you will have a characteristic for that particular component that says it needs to scale so scalability is a priority here and well if you you know listened a bit to uh, San Francisco, Silicon Valley startups, everything needs to scale, of course, but there are differences as well. Like not every component needs to scale as much as maybe different components. So you have different characteristics there. So that's what you would analyze in this step. You would look through your components and you would then um, list every characteristic that you might that you might think is important. You would prioritize them. You say, well, scalability is in this case more important than availability or the other way around. And then eventually you would decide on like three or four uh, characteristics that are important for that component. So that's also really interesting here because if you analyze your components, you might see that if you, before this analysis, you had one component and you say, well, it really needs to scale really well, uh, but it also needs a lot of security. If you know, if you ever have done that, you know that these two things don't tend to go well together because security adds overhead and that is um, the, that diminishes the ability to scale. So then you would maybe think, well, maybe I can break down that one component that has these two opposing characteristics and make two components out of it. One that has security as a priority and one that has scalability as a priority. And this is also a way of then to uh, restructure your components. So if you take all these four things, four steps into account, sorry, three steps, so three analysis steps, then you would restructure your components and do the same thing again. Maybe you would go to back, uh, you would go back to analyze the roles and responsibilities, but that also goes hand in hand with the user stories. So if you break down the components here, you might need to remap the user stories and then analyze the roles and so on. All right, so this has been the general flow of how you can approach the problem that you need to um, define some components that you will then further on analyze more and design more and maybe even start to implement. But if you want to start at the very top of, of like partitioning your problem, um, there are two ways of doing this. One of them is a technical way and the other one is a more domain driven approach or way. And the technical approach to partitioning your general system into the initial components would be to define or to separate components based on their technical capabilities. And for example, on the left, you would have a persistence component that then has some database servers that you can talk with. So you define a database or storage component. And then you might have a services component like application services that use the persistence um, component to fetch data, write data and so on. They might include some business rules even or that might be an own component as well. And then you might have a presentation um, component. So you see here, this is more like MVC layered approach. But um, this does not mean that all of this has to be on one single server. It could also be that you have four different server clusters that then communicate through different uh, communication protocols with each other. It just so th this doesn't mean that everything is on one server. It just means that you separate the system into these components. So like the presentation component could, for example, be an app that you have on your phone that then communicates with your back end, uh, which um, holds the business rules. And the thing with technical, the technical approach, um, it aligns nicely with, for example, the layered architecture. Um, so it's more easy or easier to map the components to other architectural designs or patterns that you might have used before. So that's more like the, the technical approach. It has a, a couple of problems, a couple of downsides. So one of them is you need to be aware of the Conway's law. And the Conway's law means or says that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. It's a bit loaded, but what it basically says is if you have 
an organization in place already. So this system you probably design for an, for an already existing company. And that company re will have some structures, some communication structures inside of it already. So that those might be different departments. If you have HR and then you have sales, then these departments already are structures and they communicate with each other through certain ways. And if you, if you design your software system, you need to be aware of the organizational structure so that you either design your system for that organizational structure. So you say, for example, if I have, if I have an HR department and a sales department, I will create two different components that, um, or yeah, two different components, two different systems, maybe even for these two departments. So what the Conway law says is that the organizational structure influences your architect or your software design, your, so your architectural design, so to say. And this can be good, like you can use it for your advantage. As I said, maybe you want to separate the sales department system from the HR de department. But it can also influence it negatively. We just adopt a, a structure of the organization that might not be as efficient. So maybe you can even make the organizational structure more efficient by designing a system that um, yeah, solves these inefficiencies. So maybe HR and sales should be in one department, for example, or maybe not. Maybe they should be three departments and so on. So that is the Conway's law and how it will influence you when you design the system. But there is a trick you can use, which call, is called the inverse Conway maneuver. And what it does is if you design a certain system, um, then you try to restructure the organization in order to, to promote the architecture of the system. So let's say that you design a system and you decide on creating microservices that each serve one purpose. And then what you might have in your organization is that you have a, um, a, de a development department that has backend and frontend developers. And you might even have a mobile development department that only has mobile developers. And you might also have a design department that only has designers for UI and UX. So you have like three different departments. And you say, well, that won't quite work if I have three different departments and people not really working together if I want to use microservices. Because let's say every microservice should be um, developed by a certain set of developers and designers and mobile developers. What you then can do is you say, well, I want to have microservices. So what I will do is I will, re I will refactor, restructure the organization and we'll create small scrum teams that each have one front end, one back end developer, a mobile developer and a designer in it. And this way you break up the three big departments in your organization um, into smaller teams that fit more with your software architecture. So this is a way of, of um, yeah, aligning your software architecture with the organizational structure. So there are two ways, like the organizational structure can influence your software architecture and your software architecture can influence the organizational structure. And these are two, two um, forces you cannot underestimate if you design the system. However, I talked a lot about the technical approach. Let me quickly explain a bit about the domain driven or the domain approach. It, it goes hand in hand with domain driven design. So if you're interested in that, I would recommend you read the blue book or the red book, whatever. Uh, you you like about domain driven design and if you use the domain driven approach of partitioning your system you do not look at the technical capabilities you actually don't look at tech technical well you won't really look at technical um, requirements or technical capabilities at all you rather look at the domain and at the business for example if you have a company that has some bidding a bidding uh, like an, an auction system you auction off some items um, and people bid on the items like that's your it's a part of your business that you actually have then you would rather use that concept or that uh, context is called of bidding of bidding for on an auction and creating an auction and so on as one component so you structure your system around context of like same behavior same concepts same language that is also an, always an important indicator so if a if certain people use the same language for things so if people call it an auction 
instead of a sale, for example, then you would know, okay, these people share the same language. They might have the same concept in the head of what we are talking about. So they might also be the same. They might also have the same requirements for this thing and the same use cases. So it would make sense to structure your system, your software system around these people, around that context, basically. Domain driven design is it's a huge topic. And if I go into this, uh, this video will be two or three or many, many hours. So let me just quickly, yeah, let me just say that you structure your components around um, context, basically about language um, and other things. But I would recommend you to look into that more if you're interested. And well, just to quickly uh, sum it up, if you, for example, then have a, a component partitioned by the domain approach, like bidding in this case, you would also then give it all the technical capabilities that it needs. So if it needs its own app or if it needs its own website, own backend service, own database, it will have it. Yeah, maybe it will share it with other components. Maybe not. Maybe you need a monolith. Maybe you need microservices. That's a decision for later. But in your head and on paper, you would like separate it from other components. So technical capabilities can be inside, like it can all be inside one component. It can also be shared among different components. So that is, I would say, enough about domain driven partitioning and technical partitioning. I hope you um, understood it well. Otherwise, if you have questions, you can always contact me on Twitter at Peter and Code. All right, but this has been a lot of theory, a lot of talking. Um, let's get into a case study, an example to just look at these different steps and uh, yeah, apply them. So our case study is called EBIT. It's very close to something you might know from everyday's life. You can auction off unused items, which is a requirement, and you can bid for these items. So it's basically an auctioning website for people with unused items. And um, the first thing we need to do is identify the initial components. And for this step, there are also different approaches of how to identify these components. There is the actor and actions approach, which is directly looking at the actors. So yeah, the actors who use your system and the actions they're, they're doing. Then there's more uh, a domain driven approach, which is called event storming. It's also really interesting. I use it a lot of times. I will go into that one in another video though. And there is more a workflow approach, which is kind of like the actor actions approach, but it's more general. So it's not, uh, it's looking at one workflow um, from start to end. And that workflow might also include multiple actors and multiple actions. And you can then also use that to do some event storming on top. But for this video, uh, to keep it general and interesting, I will use the actor actions approach to identify the initial components. So what we have to do basically is we have a couple of use cases and we have a couple of so actions and we have a couple of actors. And uh, we need to, to have a look at them. And maybe we can, by mapping these two, we can um, identify some components. So we have the different use cases up here, the actions, and we have an actors row over here, a column over there. So what we do now is we um, connect the actors with the actions and see where it fits and where we have overlaps. Yeah, whether these use cases always are only done by one actor or not. So um, if I am, if I look at this bidding system, the first thing that needs to happen, of course, is the item seller needs to create the actual item that should be auctioned off. He or she, the person, can view the item after they created it, but also other people want to bid on it. So the bidders might also need to be able to view that item after it's created. Once the item seller wants to, we have they can open the action. But in our case, I decided to let this be handled by the system, which yeah you will have in pretty much every first uh, iteration of of your your bigger system, because it's just like any automated component, any automated service in your backend. So in this case, I will let the system open the action, the auction, 
the item seller will define when that happens and then the system automatically does so after the auction is opened somebody can bid on the item that in this case after somebody bid on that they also want to see the latest bid uh, which is also interesting for the bidders and the item seller the item seller wants to know what is the latest price so then after the auction is done our system will close the auction and say all right that's it and that's the end of the auction and the successful bidder will need to pay for the auction so the the one with the highest bid would then need to pay the price yeah and this is the the first step this is just generating some actions mapping them to actors and we see that sometimes there is some overlap there are already some discussions that you need to uh, need to have with your domain experts so like does the system open the auction does the item seller do so does the item seller close the auction or does the system do so um, can the seller see the latest bit maybe you don't want to do it maybe you also don't want to show the latest bit to the bidders but only to the item seller so maybe the bidders are not allowed to see what the latest bit is these are all requirements that you need to discuss with your domain experts so it's a nice start of um, just generating an idea of what the system should be able to do so once you have done that you will start to um, yeah, have maybe an, an initial idea of components and you will also start to map the requirements and user stories to these components so in our in my case i decided that there should be four initial components one of them is a bit capture component that captures the bid there is a bit tracker that is independent of the capture system there is an auction session or an auction yeah that's always difficult you will have a lot of management and service components so this could be an auction management service where you can create an auction uh, open and end it and so on and eventually you also have a payment handler uh, i've yeah separated these two because payment methods you typically outsource but the bit capturing capturing you would not if you define these initial components you have to be aware of the entity trap and the entity trap is something that happens yeah quite often if you just think in terms of data schemas and data models the entity trap is basically you you get trapped by that idea that you structure your components around your uh, database your your data schema so the the use case we had for example is create item view item so you could think well there are two like crud operations already i would just create a item management component or an item component and that component simply lets me create and view items and maybe yeah um, update them and delete them as well well nice you have a crud system now but is, is, is really the item interesting here or is it a, a bigger, larger concept? Because for me, it's not only about the actual item with a description and a picture and a price, but for me, it's more an auction. So also down here, we have an open auction um, card. And I think, well, where does this auction come from? Like this thing, where does it, where is it created? So this way I thought, well, maybe the item is not like the item is not interesting but what you actually create is an auction so you create an auction that has an item that has a start date end date an item seller id whatever um, and you can view that auctions item and you can open the auction and you can close it and so on so you see that if we would have simply said well we have an item here let's just create an item component an item management or an item manager uh, we would have fallen into the entity trap and we might have missed the bigger picture here. We might have missed the, the larger uh, connections between the auction. So what is an auction? The bid, a bid not on an item, but actually on an auction and so on. So you see, you have to be careful that you don't fall into the entity trap. So let's do the step two here. So we have the four component and we need to combine these with the um, roles and the responsibilities the item seller should well handle the auction session session um, they create an item and so on the shared role of bidders and item seller 
also are connected to the auction session because they can view items, but they are also connected to the bid tracker because they uh, can see the latest bid. Moving on, we have the bidders and the bidders, they, we map them to the bid capture component because they can use a component. They can also use the payment handler and our system can interact with the auction session. And I would say that's it for now. All right, so now we have mapped the roles and responsibilities to our components. And I can see already that quite a lot of arrows or responsibilities go to the auction session. So this would be a component that I would need to define further in the future, because with three different roles, all pointing to the same components, you will probably have different requirements and different needs of these two actors eventually. So maybe the system actor needs different requirements or has different requirements on the auction session component than the item seller. The auction session is something I would then take into account for, for another round of analysis eventually. But let's just move on to the third step, which is talking about the analyzing the roles and the responsibilities themselves. And here you would now analyze whether the roles and responsibilities that you identified in your, in this case, actor actions approach still make sense after this round of discussion. The only thing I'm going to do for now to keep this short is to rename this role because while discussing the use cases and mapping them to our initial components, I realize that it's not about like an item that you sell, but it's actually about an auction that you hold. So this could be renamed to an auctioneer. We still have bidders and we still have a system. Usually you split up, you would split up here the system role into different roles, but we only had two use cases in our example. So for that, it doesn't make sense. But for now, let's just keep it with these. So to keep the example short. So let's move on to the fourth step, which is the analyze architectural characteristic step. And for me, this is the most fun one because it is technical and you can think about what your system should be able to do and handle and so on. So what you can see here is I assigned just some characteristics that that I thought of. And uh, there is an ISO standard that holds a couple of characteristics. So it explains a couple of like, I don't think even has scalability in it, but there are some officially defined characteristics that might interest you if you need a like a list of them. So this is more something you have to think about yourself. I made an initial, just an initial, an initial analysis of uh, the components. And I saw already that there are different com characteristics for each component. So for example, the bit capture has as a first characteristic, the elastic elasticity characteristic. This means that you don't need to handle a heightened workload all the time. But elasticity is more you have temporal high peaks of traffic of workload. So it's not all the time a high workload, but it's only like small be peaks, small bumps. And for the bit capture component, this is important because typically auctions get bid on or receive a lot of bids shortly before they, they are over, shortly before they run out or they, so just a couple of seconds uh, before the, or maybe one second before the auction ends, a lot of people are throwing bids at it. So this means that our bid capture component rather needs to handle that really temporal high peaks of workload. So it needs to scale with it instead of having a, a continuous high level of, of workload to handle with. And this is different, for example, from the bid tracker, because uh, for one auction or multiple auctions, you have the elasticity characteristics. But if you take thousands and millions of auctions together, all the peaks taken together is still a wor high workload. So in this case, the bid tracker for me would rather have a characteristic of scalability rather than elasticity. So here you, you already see that it might have made sense to separate these two bit capture, uh, these two components, because the one has a different first elast, uh, um, characteristic than the second. And if I only had a bidding system, I might not have seen it. I might have said, well, elasticity goes, goes hand in hand with scalability. So I'm just going to make it one component. 
my, my point here is simply by analyzing the characteristics of these components, you, you see already that there are different requirements here. Now, there's one last thing that I want to share with you, which I learned in this book, and it is the discussion about whether you need a monolith or you need a modular monolith, monolith or microservices. So the discussion is rather, do you need a monolith or can you do all these things with just one monolith, with one server, one code base, and so on, or whether you need to actually separate the code into either modular monolith, so you really separate the modules inside that one server, that one code base, or you go with microservices that all hold their own code base and so on. For example, with the bit capture component, the bit tracker component, I would probably separate them because the elasticity characteristic has different solutions than the scalability characteristic. So that's just one last idea. Uh, yeah, so the saying goes, if these uh, characteristics play nice together, so if all these components would have the same characteristic or the same requirement of scalability, for example, then you could say, well, I just put everything into one monolith and I scale that one uh, because all of the other components need scalability too. But if you see, as we saw here, differences in the characteristics, um, then you might say, well, I do not go with the monolith approach. I might do a modular monolith approach or I might do a microservice approach. That then also depends on your team size, your company size and many other factors. All right, this has been another very long video about software architecture in general. I hope you learned something from it. I hope um, you have some new leads that you can follow. I can highly recommend the book Fundamentals of Software Architecture. If you have any other questions, you can contact me on Twitter at Peter and Code or PJ Ulrich, my private Twitter account. So yeah, if you have any questions, please reach out. Otherwise, I guess what I should say is please leave a thumbs up and a subscribe. If you like this video, I will now in the next videos go back to more Elixir focused topics. I will code again. I will show you some cool libraries and so on. But I just wanted to get this one out to show you that I learned a bit about software architecture and share the, the knowledge with you. Stay safe and I hope to see you in the next one. Take care.